Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 12 today, along with uh, a meditation afterwards. I'm just really glad you're here with me. I saw some of you there. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Randy and Terry. Hi, Karen. Um, I know Ricky uh, Watkins frequently joins us and also his daughter, Susan. So if you're here, Susan, welcome. It's really nice to have you. Um, just really enjoy doing this every day. Um, I enjoy the preparation, but I enjoy really studying the Psalms. It's been a very good discipline for me, a very good uh, study for me. And today we come, a, come upon one of those Psalms that's not an easy Psalm. It's a Psalm again, like yesterday and the day before and the day before that, that speaks of the wickedness of, of human beings, the wickedness of our lives. Um, I looked a little bit of news this morning, not much, just a little bit. I looked at the CDC site and saw that in New York uh, yesterday, 779 people died in one day. And these pictures of um, mass burial sites in the Bronx, where they're digging large trenches in the graveyard to bury caskets. It's a horrific picture. And over the next seven days, we know that those numbers are going to grow. And they're not just numbers, they're individual people with families who love them and children and brothers and sisters and wives and, and husbands. So again, our world is grieving today. I pray that you are safe, that you are well, that you are acting wisely. I have two daughters that will get me in trouble if I go anywhere, so I appreciate their care for me very much. Love all of you very much. It means the world to me that you're here. Let's pray. Father, I just uh, thank you for today. I just thank you for this day and for your presence with us, Lord. I just pray that you would even give me words in my prayer, Lord. I fall short so many times, Lord, and how do you pray in the midst of a pandemic like this? We pray for mercy and grace. We pray that you would stand up and act and bring this quickly to an end. We pray that you would comfort those who are losing loved ones, even on this auspicious day when we remember the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Families who not, cannot be with their loved ones even as they are dying. For some families who will be separated forever. So, Father, I pray that you would uh, comfort these families. They are unbeknownst to us. I even saw yesterday, Lord, in the news, uh, the report of a folk singer who I listened to when I was young, John Prine, passed away, and his wife also has Fiona, has, uh, Fiona also has the virus. And so we pray that Fiona would survive and we pray comfort upon her and her family. But all around the world, families are grieving, Lord. And for whatever reason, you have allowed this pandemic to happen. You didn't see to stop it. And I can ask why, but only in your counsel, in, your, in your, the depth of your heart and in the depth of your unfathomable understanding, do you know, does anyone know what you're doing? But I know at the core of it, you love us, Lord. You love this world. And so however you're allowing this, Don't forget that you love us, Lord. Don't forget that you love this tired old world 
full of wickedness and sin and rebellion and selfishness. Full of pride. I pray that above all other things, that the world would turn to you. That in and through this pandemic, you would turn their attention to heaven. That you would turn their attention to the love of God. You would uh, turn their attention to the grace of Jesus. That you would return their attention to the power of the Spirit. I pray for a great harvest. That many, many people will come to know you. And trust their lives to you. Father, we thank you that not on this very day, but this is the day upon which we celebrate it, but you sent your only son to give up his life for us, to take all of our sin in his own body, taking the just punishment of the law and the just curse of the law in his own body and in his own person. And when you died, all of our sin, all the just requirement of the law, all of the curse of the law, died with you. And we give you praise, Lord. We give you for the we we give you praise for the fullness of the pardon that you have given to us. We give you praise for forgiveness. May we in turn forgive each other where we are holding on to bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. May we forgive from, from the heart, realizing and understanding how much you have forgiven us. May we love as you have loved. May we grace, may we grace other people as you have graced us. But only by your spirit, Lord. So once again, I pray for myself and for everyone listening and those who will yet be listening, whenever that is, that you would fill us with an extraordinary, extraordinary measure of your spirit, the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the love poured out in our hearts by the spirit, that we might love those around us, even those most unlovable. That the fruit of the spirit of love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, that, the, that this fruit might blossom in our lives and we might be kind even to those who are unkind. That we would be patient with those who are impatient. That we would be loving to those who are unloving. That we would be gentle with those who are anything but gentle. And finally, Lord, I thank you that your perfect love casts out fear. We have nothing to fear if we have entrusted our life to Christ, if we have believed, if we have believed in Jesus, we have nothing to fear. Your perfect love casts out fear, for fear involves punishment. And Father, you've already punished us in the body of your Son. We give you praise, we give you thanks. Words fall short, Lord. How can we thank you for what Jesus did for us? How can we ever thank you? But to say, I'm yours. Today, I am yours. And for those who haven't called out, save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Thanks again for joining me today. So we're looking at Psalm 10, 12 today, and it's a, a sort of a psalm of lament. It is a psalm of lament. And it begins with just a few short words. Help, Lord. I love that. What words for today? Help, Lord. So today, let's cry out to God. Help, Lord. Simple prayer, short prayer says in Matthew that he doesn't hear us for our many words. Don't be the 
be, don't be like the Gentiles who think that they will be heard uh, by their uh, many words. And it goes on, for your heavenly father knows what you need even before you ask him. So today, let's make it our prayer. Help, Lord. Now join with me. I'll be reading Psalm 12. Psalm 12, it's, it's for the choir director upon an eight-string lyre, which was a kind of guitar. It's a Psalm of David, beginning with verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. And so we come in this text to... Uh, uh, in a psalm, to another chiasm, a chiastic structure. It's a structure that was discovered by our own Nils Lund, one of the ministers in the covenant back around 1910 or 1920. I don't know the exact date when he discovered it, but um, it's a structure that um, has a pattern to it, and it's defined uh, by Wikipedia. I, went, I showed this when we were doing Psalm 5, a chiasm is a reversal of grammatical structures in successive phases or clauses, but no repetition of words. So you have this reversal of grammatic structure. So you go start with A1, then you go to B1, C1, then you have the C2, and then you start backing out of the, the passage or the psalm to B2 and then to A2. And always in a chiasm, the, the center point, the point that's being emphasized is that C1 and C2. It can be up to D, E, F. Some of them are very long, but this one happens to have uh, three in and three out. But again, it's that reversal. And with no repetition of words, that's loosely no, no repetition of words. There's a few repetitions of words in this psalm, like the Lord and among the sons of men. But So this is a chiasm, and it's beautiful when you actually see what it's doing in its structure. Um, the Bible is amazing. It's, it's written by the Holy Spirit. Uh, using human uh, humans as paintbrushes or uh, quills, if you will. And so uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, and I'm going to keep it up. I hope you can read this all right. Uh, uh, so we'll begin at the beginning with A1. Help, Lord. I love that. Right off the bat, he just says, help, Lord. It's one of the shortest and simplest and most direct prayers I've, I think I've ever heard. Help, Lord. What a prayer for today. If we can cry out together, help, Lord. For the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. So here he's speaking globally of the entire earth. Uh, you'll notice down below, he again says, You, O Lord, will keep them. You'll preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness exalted among the sons of men. So you have Lord and Lord and then among the sons of men and among the sons of men. We'll get to that last part. We'll explain it. But Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. We don't know, again, the occasion of this psalm, whether it's during the time of Saul or during the time of Absalom or another time, we're not told. But it's, it's during a time when David looked around at the society around him, and all there was was corruption and wickedness and sin, departing from the covenant that they had with God under the Mosaic covenant and, and, um, that had been established by Moses. 
And so the godly man is, is, is a person, whether a man or a woman, who is defined as somebody who would be under the law, keeping the law, who put their trust in Yahweh, who is uh, attempting to live a pious, a righteous life, if you will. The godly man ceases to be. And then it says, for the faithful, the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. So he's talking about everywhere he looks, he doesn't find faith anymore. That word faithful uh, elsewhere is, tr is used as the word to believe. And so it's, it's someone who is full of faith, full of belief. For those who are full of belief, full of faith in, in Yahweh, full of faith in the Lord, disappear from among the sons of men. Sounds like today, doesn't it? For the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. Um, it could be described as our society. Uh, I know there are people who are righteous in our society by the shed blood of Christ, but that number is dwindling. As you look at uh, Europe, uh, Germany and France, the birthplace of the Ref Reformation, where the world was turned on its head through Martin Luther and men like John Calvin and Zwingli and so on, uh, through that gospel, that rediscovered gospel of the grace and truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those countries have less than 3% or even less than 1% of people who would call themselves Christians. And so help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from the sons of men. It was a dark time in David's, in David's life. I think this was prior to his being a king. If he was king, he could have done something about it. Well, it, it might not have been. It could have been while he was king. Because at one point with Absalom, the whole kingdom turns against him, comes after him to kill him. And then we go into this, uh, further into the structure, B1. They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. So right off the bat, it starts off with they speak falsehood. They're lying. Uh, people lie all the time uh, in this culture. They, uh, you couldn't trust them. When you were in a covenant with someone or with God, uh, it was based on your integrity, the integrity of your words, that you kept your word. When we have a society where everyone is speaking falsehood, you can't trust anybody's word. Nobody keeps covenants. Nobody keeps contract, contracts. Everybody will lie to get ahead. Uh, the society, as we saw yesterday, the foundations start, start crumbling. So in David's day, there was a time in, in his life when it seemed like everybody was speaking falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. That word flattering lips, the word flattering there literally means uh, to be really smooth, like glassy smooth or slippery. So with smooth and slippery lips. Uh, our advertising is smooth and slippery selling us, making us want and selling us all these things that we really don't need, but sometimes are we nearly wretch for want of them. Uh, they are lying to us. Things like helps fight cavities. Well, the word helps doesn't mean a thing. It can mean a little bit or a lot. It doesn't say anything. It, it, they can't say this brand fights cavities. They can't say that. Or virtually, the word virtually, it virtually cleans. Uh, with, with no work. Well, it virtually means not in fact, in point, but not in fact. Um, works like a white tornado. So you see this powder, you put it on your tub and it's working incredibly. And well, what works like a white tornado is your elbow, your arm, your... And so we lie all the time in our society. And we, we, take, we actually make an industry of lying through advertising and through politics. All the promises that people give that politicians give and never intend to keep them. They're just empty promises. And so we don't trust politicians anymore, do we? Uh, the, they speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart. Literally that's, and with a heart heart, it's the word heart twice. And so again, they spoke pictorially. So instead of having a word for double, they just said with heart heart, they speak with one heart and another heart. I, I know this full well when I was uh, in, in my drug days, I was a very double-minded man. I'd go down to my family's uh, homes in the Olympia area. I had a lot of lots of family living in Olympia, 
And when I was with them, I just longed to be out of the drug world and out of the, the alcoholism and out of that uh, debauchery that I was living in, all that sin and rebellion that I was living in. At the very same time, I was at the, I was thinking, where can I get my next uh, score? Who am I going to uh, use drugs with tonight when I get home? Who can I call over to come over and drink drink with them? And I was completely double-minded. This heart, heart, uh, heart meant uh, not your emotions. Heart to the Hebrew uh, people again meant your mind and predominantly your mind and volition. And so. With flattering lips and with heart, heart, they speak with a double mind. They wear masks, so you can't trust them. Does that sound familiar today? May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. That's not a very flattering picture, if you will. May he cut off uh, all flattering lips. Uh, it's a rather horrific, gory picture. But it gets the point through, doesn't it? The tongue that speaks great things. This can be also, uh, it's the idea of great, and it can be also used of, of sound, so it can be loud things. And it's not saying that, that the tongue that speaks loud things in the sense of they're yelling it, but in the sense of loud things, I'm, I'm speaking with great pride and claiming more than I, I can. Do you know that when you uh, speak with pride and with haughtiness and presumption or with, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, pompousness, when you speak as a pompous person, you're speaking not truthfully. You're adding to your words, you're adding uh, to the truth of your words by making them sound bigger and greater and louder than they really are. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. So they put their trust in their words. They can convince, they can woo, they can manipulate. Uh, sounds like our day again. With our tongue we will prevail. We can overcome through our words. Our lips are our, are our own. Our lips are our own. We aren't accountable to anyone for what we speak, is what these people were saying uh, in David's day. We can say anything we want because we own our own tongues. We own our own lips. Who is Lord over us? God isn't Lord over us. Yahweh isn't Lord over us. Either they're, as we saw yesterday, they don't believe in God at all, or they believe that he's asleep, or that he has no interest, or that he won't hold us to account. That isn't the God that we read in the Bible. He is a God who holds people to account while loving us, while offering us extravagant grace. Yet at the same time, he holds people to account. And oftentimes through the consequences of our own behavior. He just allows us to fall into the pit we have dug. Well, as a nation and as nations in the world, we knew a pandemic like this was coming for years. Epidemiologists were warning about this and very few nations actually prepared, prepared for it well. And so now we're falling, falling into the pit of our own making, thinking that it would never happen. It wouldn't touch us in our lifetime. Who do you blame? Well, the blame falls on the entire world, on all of us. So that's B. If you look down be below, well, we'll get there. I'll, I'll show you the contrast when we get there. Then we get to the heart of the psalm. It says, because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy. So all these wicked people with their flattering words and their flattering tongues and their flattering lips and their lying words, Who's being affected the most by all this deception going on? Those who are afflicted, the devastation of the afflicted, meaning the lowly, the poor, because of the groaning of the needy, those who are most wanting in our society. Who are those most wanting in our society right now? I think of the mentally ill. Um, President Reagan, uh, whether you like him or not, one of the things that he did was he closed down all the uh, federal institutions, the mental institutions. And so pushing a lot of those mentally ill people out in the streets into homelessness. Um, I have a gripe with that. To the extent that we don't care for the weakest amongst us, the mentally ill, the widows, the orphans, all the foster children. And I would add to that the unborn who are fully human beings with a unique DNA without 
um, extraordinary intervention would come to life and be born. We are denying their rights. And as I've said before, when Cain killed Abel, Abel's blood cried out from the ground and God heard it. What does the blood of 66 million babies, what does the sound of their blood sound like to our Lord? What does the sound of over a million babies' blood, that deafening silence of a roar, sound like to our God? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. What he means is I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do something about it. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. I will set her in the safety for which she longs. Now I will arise, meaning God is about to act. And I will set those who have been devastated by affliction and set those who are groaning in their neediness. I will set them in, safe, in the safety for which they long. All around us, there are people who long for a better life, long for a better world. All around the world, people are longing for a better life. And the chief problem uh, for why uh, people don't have a better life is because of corrupt ruling officials, predominantly corrupt ruling officials all around the world. And so the heart of it is, the heart of this psalm is that God is going to stand up. He's going to act. He's going to provide safety for us as those afflicted and needy and of ourselves. I think it describes really every human being if we but recognize it. Don't we long for safety? Don't you long for safety in this day and in this week and in this month and in this year? I love those memes that say, we thought March was bad, and then it has a picture of April, and it's the planet with the Death Star over the horizon. Uh, yeah. Can we pray that God would stand up today? That he would bring safety for those of us who long for safety? And then it continues, and now we start backing out of the psalm. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words. They are pure words. There's nothing adulterating these, his words. And notice that it's contrasted. Now, there's a contrast in this chiasm. It's contrasted with those who speak falsehood, those who have flattering lips, who have a heart heart, the double heart, uh, tongues that speak great things, loud, boisterous, pompous things who believe that our tongue, our words will prevail? Who, do we, who are we held accountable to? Who is Lord over us? And then the Lord, in contrast to all of that, we have the words of the Lord are pure words. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. Uh, I think it's in John who says, my words are spirit and they are life. My words are spirit and they are life. They offer the gift of life in his very words. The words of the Lord are pure words. That word Lord again is Yahweh. And so we know that it's also in the mystery of the Trinity, Jesus. He says, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. So when you uh, smelt a, a, an ore, you put it into a smelter to, to take out the impurities and like ore, you, you try to get the silver out of it. But this silver has been refined seven times, which is the number of perfection. So you can't refine the silver anymore. There's nothing in it but silver. It's 100% pure silver. And likening that to the words of the Lord, his words are completely pure. They're honest. They're truthful. They do not lie. When he promises, he keeps his promise. He speaks truth into our very hearts. He speaks truth about our wickedness. To the woman caught in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn you, words of grace, but then words of truth, go and leave your life of sin. 
The words of the Lord are pure words. You know what we hold in our hands when we have a Bible? Uh, we hold words that are pure. We hold words that have no, nothing adulterating it. We so, so oftentimes adulterate the gospel with our own commandments and teachings, the commandments and teachings of men. I'm not interested in giving you the commandments and teachings of men. I want you to feast on the pure word of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the pure word of God our Father, on the pure word that's mediated to us and illuminated to us by the Holy Spirit. And then we back out further. So there's that contrast between the flattering words of the world and the lying words of the, of the world around us and his pure words. And then we back out to A, A2. You, O Lord, will keep them. Keep what? Keep those who are being um, afflicted? No, it's his words. O Lord, you will keep them. In other, in other words, he never fails to keep his word. When he promises, he always follows through. When he promises, he cannot lie. In fact, he makes an oath in which he cannot lie to keep his promise. You will preserve him from this generation forever. Who is the him? Well, you got to go up to the top, the parallel, the godly man who ceases to be. Well, there's always a remnant left behind of godly men, godly women, that you will preserve from this generation, from that corrupt generation uh, in, in which David was living. And so these are David's words. You, O Lord, will keep them. He's now addressing the Lord in first person or in second person, you, O Lord, and same as uh, A1, that first verse. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this evil world, God will preserve us. Does that mean there's going to be no Christians that die from this? Can't say that. Um, I'm not saying that this is a judgment of God. I cannot say that because I'm not God. But it sure feels like it, doesn't it? Our perception can be that it's, that it's a judgment. But there's a judgment coming that will be true judgment when the world will be burned up with fire, with such heat that the elements will melt. And then will come the great white throne judgment. Will every, everyone who's ever lived and who will yet ever live will be held accountable. And the first thing will be held accountable is what did you do with the offer? Uh, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ, and the offer that he gives of eternal life? Did you receive the gift? Did you believe him? And if not, then we are left in our own sin, left to our own devices, left to our own measure of righteousness. I'm so thankful that he will preserve a remnant in, a, in every generation. And then David gives this little postscript. It's his own words after. So really it's not a part of the chiasm. It's an afterthought. And he says, the wicked strut about on every side. They're just going out, out in the open, strutting about like, like uh, roosters, uh, walking around on every side. They're all around us, the, the wicked, when vileness is exalted among the sons of men, when the things that are vile are lifted up. That's our culture right now. That's our society. When everything that God has condemned, both in the law but also in the New Testament, is now lifted up as uh, something of value. Woe to you when you call things that are good evil and e things that are evil good, as Isaiah has it. So David is left with the reality of, of where he's at. He's still seeing the wicked strutting about on every side. He's still seeing the viol vileness, this worthlessness. It, it, it's a word that can mean worthlessness. Don't we exalt things that are worthless? Think about the Super Bowl advertising, and we exalt those. We love them. Uh, I like to watch them. They're funny. They're, they're brilliant sometimes. But to be honest, most of it is worthless. When worthlessness exalted among the sons of men. And again, this is speaking globally of the whole world at the time, and speaking globally uh, to our whole world at the time. So you can read this later, but it's this beautiful structure. And at the beginning, at the very center of it is this call. 
or this promise of God. Now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him, I will set her in the safety for which she longs, for which she longs. So I, I look at the end and it always makes me nervous when I, when I speak or talk about uh, Psalms like this because it makes it sound like they're righteous people and they're unrighteous people and that we're among the righteous, we're among the godly because of, man, look at how uh, good I've been. As we've seen the last two two days in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Together, we have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so how do you get from being, I, I've been a very vile man in my life. That describes me early in my days. I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a drug addict punk uh, drug addict. I was a punk drug dealer. I was a, a perverse man. How do you meet, move from being a person like that, which I was fully blown into that lifestyle? People who knew me back then are shocked that I'm even alive. They're even more shocked that I'm married and have uh, two wonderful daughters and a wonderful wife. And they're even more shocked when they find out that I'm a minister. Um, I didn't become a minister because I wanted to. Uh, I didn't become a minister because I had to. I became a minister because God has been so gracious to me. Because he called me. He gave me back words. After that severe head injury in which I lost my ability to speak. He gave me back words to sing his praises. To sing his glory. To sing the, the extravagance and wonder of his grace to sing the immeasurable, boundless, unfathomable, unconditional love of Christ and the love of God. So how do you move from being a person like B1 and A1, a godless person, a person who's full of lying sin, how do you move from that to being a godly man who will be preserved, who will be guarded, who will be kept from this evil generation? Well, it's, it's so easy. I don't want to say it's so easy. It's so simple. John 3.16 gives us this wonderful invitation, this wonderful promise. To me, this is one of the promises of promises in the Bible. This is the gospel boiled down to its essential character and to its essential matter. It says, for God so loved the world. He so loved the entire world, not just talking about the planet, but of every human being made in his image. He has so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's one thing to give, give up a son, like in wartime, you allow your son to go into battle. It's one thing to give up a son from among many, but it's another to give up your only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever believes that he is God in the flesh, that he is the Messiah, the one who came to take all of our sin on the cross and die, that we might be crucified with Jesus. We are in him when he is crucified. Whoever believes in Jesus should not perish, should not be destroyed, but have eternal life, have everlasting life. Life that goes on forever and ever, but it's also a quality of life, of living in that boundless, unconditional immeasurable, unfathomable love of God and the love of Jesus. Should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes, it's open to the whole world, from the most uh, put-together person to the most vile person, to the most wicked person, to the most violent person. It's open to everyone. As a gift, whoever believes, you entrust your life into the hands of God. When I was a little boy living in Japan on uh, I lived three blocks from the Tokaido, which was a highway that went from the main highway. They didn't have freeways back then. My dad was a missionary, so I lived in Japan. That road went from Osaka to Tokyo, and so it was a very, very busy highway, just two lanes. And in Japan, there was no crosswalks at, at that time, or very few. And there was an orphanage across the street from where we lived, right on the Tokaido. And my dad would want me to, to take me over to the orphanage to visit a, a little boy who's Mother had died, and his dad worked so much that he lived in the orphanage and spent the weekends with his dad. So dad would take me over to visit my friend, this, this orphan in the orphanage, and we'd go over maybe once or twice a week, and we'd get to the Tokaido, and I'm three years old. Uh, 
not much higher than, than the knee of a grasshopper, just this little kid, and the traffic is just constantly going by. In Japan, when you wanted to get across the street, all you did was you raise up your hand, put it up like this, except for high, and then you would just plunge into traffic, and everybody would screech to a stop. You'd put it up a few seconds before you entered. Well, could I have gotten across that street by raising my hand as a little boy? No, I was so short, so small, I would have been run over almost immediately. It would have been impossible for me to get across. But I would turn to my dad and I would look up to him and he would pick me up and he would hoist me and put me over his shoulders with my knees and my legs hanging over uh, the front of him. And then he would put up his hand, wait for maybe 15 seconds, all the traffic would come to a stop and then he would go across. To believe is to it is an, another definition of to believe is to entrust your life into the way into the hands and the arms of the one who can save you. That's what it means is to believe in him, to believe what he said about himself, to be persuaded that he is the son of God, to be persuaded by his word that he is the Messiah, but also to say, Jesus, save me. Do for me what I cannot do for myself. that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world. He didn't come, come to condemn us. Do you hear that in this pandemic? Jesus has not come. God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn us. He came, he sent the Son into the world, that we might be saved through Jesus. So for all of you out there, all of you Christians out there who are saying this is the condemnation of God, this is the judgment of God on us, if he's doing anything through allowing this, it's in order to, order to save us. He doesn't want to condemn us. He has never wanted to con condemn a single human being on the planet. No matter what you've done, no matter how violent you've been, no matter how treacherous or, or uh, sexually perverse you've been. I've been all of these things. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes, that whoever believes, all you have to do is acknowledge, be persuaded. It's not even your doing, it's just to be persuaded that he is the creator, that through him all things were created. In him all things hold together. He is the one who knit you while you were yet in your mother's womb. And he desires to save you. Call out to him, save me, Jesus. And then I think of, it's not just getting eternal life and then we can go off and live any way we want. The whole point of the gospel was that Christ would die for us and thereby forgive our sins. We would be crucified with him in his death. We would be in him. When he rose from the dead, we were in him as a creator. We have not been yet created. So we were in the mind and heart of the creator. Um, when he rose to, um, to life from the dead, when Jesus uh, raised his body to life, Romans says we were saved through that. So we're forgiven, we're saved. Well, he doesn't just leave us forgiven and saved. He ascended into heaven, presented his own blood in the true holy of holies as a satisfaction, as a complete covering, as, as a complete uh, uh, atoning sacrifice for our sin meaning our sin is completely taken care of in the blood of Jesus, in order that he might send the Spirit to live within us. And so this verse, this is my life verse. This is the verse that I live by day by day. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer that old evil grant that's living. I've been killed with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I could never do the living. I tried all the time, try harder and harder to live the Christian life. And the more, the more I tried, the the more I failed and the more miserable, miserable I became and the more I believed in my heart, the Christian life doesn't work. It appears to be working for everybody else, but we're all, uh, we all have heart hearts. We're all double-minded. We're showing everybody else the best of our character while inwardly are full of dead men's bo bones and full of uh, corruption. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I don't have to live. I invite through the Holy Spirit the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And now my job is just to trust him. And now the life I, and the life I now live in the flesh in the sometimes or all the time corruption of my flesh, including my body, my will, my emotions, my soul, my mind. I live by faith, by trusting. I live by faith in the Son of God. I live by trusting the Son of God. I live by looking to Jesus, not, not to myself, but looking to him who loved me, who loved you, and gave himself up for you. So how do you live once you've been saved and you live, are living in this eternal state of, of life now? You live by being a dead man. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. You live by being a dead woman. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life we now live in this body that is still oftentimes corrupt, we live by not looking to ourselves, but we live by looking to Jesus and remembering two things. When you fail, don't promise that you won't do it again. You will do it again if you look to yourself. You look away from yourself. You look away to the power of his grace. You look away to the depth of his love and you remember two things. That he loved you and he gave himself up for you. He loved you and he gave himself up for you. That's the cross. That's what we celebrate today. Is this infathom, unfathomable love of God. Where there you have it, there's the gospel. We're saved unto eternal life. It's given to us the moment we believe. Truly, 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 I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent, who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. She does not come into judgment. No condemnation. He does not come into judgment, but has passed, has already passed from death to life. The moment you believe, you're given the gift of eternal life. Make these verses your life verses. These are life verses for everyone. I live today as a dead man. What do dead people do? Nothing. I still have to go about my day. I still have to prepare and all of that. But, you know, I, I don't look to myself. I don't trust myself. I, I haven't trusted myself in many years. I know how fickle I can be. And I know how fickle you can be. Heart, heart. Flattering lips. Smooth and slippery lips. So choose to live by trusting this Son of God, by trusting Jesus by looking to him and remembering that he loves you and he loves you to the extent that he gave himself up for you. Amen. So again, thank you for joining me. It was really two messages, uh, the message of Psalm 10, but how do we move from being a wicked, vile person to being a person whose life is being transformed from one degree of glory to another into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ? For this comes from the spirit, that transforming power. I can't claim any of the goodness has been generated by me. Any of the kindness that he has created in my life has all come from him. He is my all in all. I pray that he is your all in all. Let's close in prayer. Father, just I thank you for this day. I thank you for this day on which we remember that Jesus died for us, but really every day is Good Friday. Every day is a day in which we remember I've been crucified with Christ. I live as a dead man. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. And so, Father, I'm reminded of the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. So I pray, pray these words of Paul back to you, Lord. For this reason... We bow our knees before you, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that you would grant all those within the hearing of my words, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do 
exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen well thanks for joining me today uh, good Friday I went a little long there's no time limit to this there's no time limit uh, when you are when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of my life I so appreciate his work in and through my life I pray that he is full in your life. Don't forget to ask for that infilling. Today, Lord, fill me with a great measure of your spirit. Ask big. Today, Lord, fill me with an extraordinary measure of your spirit. For I am but an earthen vessel. I am but an earthen vessel. Thanks for coming. Uh, I won't be here tomorrow, but Sunday we're celebrating our uh, Resurrection Sunday, as like, I like to call it. Uh, we'll be starting at 11 a.m. Everyone is welcome to come. No matter who you are, where you've been, even what your faith is, you're all welcome to come and join us in celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you Sunday at 11 a.m. And now I have two benedictions, two blessings here. Here are closing words. From Romans 5, 13, 15, 13. What wonderful words for today. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and, and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.